Sun Dried by Edna Ferber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Sun Dried by Edna Ferber. There come those times in the life of every woman when she feels that she must wash her hair at once, and then she does it. The feeling may come upon her suddenly, without warning, at any hour of the day or night, or its approach may be slow and insidious, so that the victim does not at first realize what it is that fills her with that sensation of unrest. But once, in the clutches of the idea, she knows no happiness, no peace, until she has donned a kimono, gathered up two bath towels, a spray, and the green soap, and she breathes again only when, head dripping, she makes for the back yard, the sitting-room radiator, or the side porch, depending on her place of residence and the time of year. Mary Louise was seized with the feeling at ten o'clock on a joyous June morning. She tried to fight it off because she had got to that stage in the construction of her story where her hero was beginning to talk and act a little more like a real live man and a little less like a clothing store dummy. By the way, they don't seem to be using those pink and white, black mustachioed figures any more. Another good simile gone. Mary Louise had been battling with that hero for a week. He wouldn't make love to the heroine. In vain had Mary Louise striven to instill red blood into his watery veins. He and the beauteous heroine were as far apart as they had been on page one of the typewritten manuscript. Mary Louise was developing nerves over him. She had bitten her fingernails and twisted her hair into corkscrews over him. She had risen every morning at the chaste hour of seven, breakfasted hurriedly, tidied the tiny two-room apartment, and sat down in the unromantic morning light to wrestle with her stick of a hero. She had made her heroine a creature of grace, wit, and loveliness, but thus far the hero had not once clasped her to him fiercely, or pressed his lips to her hair, her eyes, her cheeks. Nay, as the story-writers would put it, he hadn't even devoured her with his gaze. This morning, however, he had begun to show some signs of life. He was developing possibilities. Whereupon, at this critical stage in the story-writing game, the hair-washing mania seized Mary Louise. She tried to dismiss the idea. She pushed it out of her mind and slammed the door. It only popped in again. Her fingers wandered to her hair. Her eyes wandered to the June sunshine outside. The hero was left poised, arms outstretched, an unquenchable love-light burning in his eyes, while Mary Louise mused thus. It certainly feels sticky. It's been six weeks at least, and I could sit here by the window, in the sun, and dry it. With a jerk she brought her straying fingers away from her hair, and her wandering eyes away from the sunshine, and her runaway thoughts back to the typewritten page. For three minutes the snap of the little discs crackled through the stillness of the tiny apartment. Then, suddenly, as though succumbing to an irresistible force, Mary Louise rose, walked across the room, a matter of six steps, removing hairpins as she went, and shoved aside the screen which hid the stationary washbowl by day. Mary Louise turned on a faucet and held her finger under it, while an agonized expression of doubt and suspense overspread her features. Slowly the look of suspense gave way to a smile of beatific content. A sigh, deep, soul-filling, satisfied, welled up from Mary Louise's breast. The water was hot. Half an hour later, head swathed, turban fashion, in a towel, Mary Louise strolled over to the window. Then she stopped aghast. In that half-hour the sun had slipped just around the corner, and was now beating brightly and uselessly against the brick wall a few inches away. Slowly Mary Louise unwound the towel, bent double in the contortionistic attitude that women assume on such occasions, and watched with melancholy eyes while the drops trickled down to the ends of her hair and fell unsunned to the floor. If only thought Mary Louise, bitterly, there was such a thing as a backyard in the city, a backyard where I could squat on the grass in the sunshine and the breeze. 
maybe there is i'll ask the janitor she bound her hair in the turban again and opened the door at the far end of the long dim hallway charlie the janitor was doing something to the floor with a mop and a great deal of sloppy water whistling the while with a shrill abandon that had announced his presence to mary louise oh charlie called mary louise charlie can you come here just a minute you bet answered charlie with the accent on the u and came charlie is there a back yard or something where the sun is you know some nice grassy place where i can sit and dry my hair and let the breezes blow it back yard grinned charlie i guess you're new to new york all right with ground costin a million or so a foot not much they ain't no back yard unless you'd give that name to an ash barrel and a dump heap or so and a crop of tin cans i wouldn't invite a goat to sit in it disappointment curved mary louise's mouth it was a lovely enough mouth at any time but when it curved in disappointment l janitors are but human after all tell you what though said charlie i'll let you up on the roof it ain't long on grassy spots up there but say breeze like a summer resort on a clear day you can see way over as far as eight avenue only for the love of mike don't blab it to the other women folks in the buildin or i'll have the whole works of em usin the roof for a general sun massage and beauty parlor come on i'll never breathe it to a soul promised mary louise solemnly oh wait a minute she turned back into her room appearing again in a moment with something green in her hand what's that asked charlie suspiciously mary louise speeding down the narrow hallway after charlie blushed a little it's it's parsley she faltered parsley exploded charlie well what the well you see i'm from the country explained mary louise and in the country at this time of year when you dry your hair in the back yard you get the most wonderful scent of green and growing things not only of flowers you know but of the new things just coming up in the vegetable garden and and well this parsley happens to be the only really gardeny thing i have so i thought i'd bring it along and sniff it once in a while and make believe it's the country up there on the roof halfway up the perilous little flight of stairs that led to the roof charlie the janitor turned to gaze down at mary louise who was just behind and keeping fearfully out of the way of charlie's heels women observed charlie the janitor is nothing but little girls in long skirts and their hair done up i know it giggled mary louise and sprang up on the roof looking with her towel swathed head like a lady aladdin leaping from her underground grotto the two stood there for a moment looking up at the blue sky and all about at the june sunshine if you go up high enough observed mary louise the sunshine is almost the same as it is in the country isn't it i shouldn't wonder said charlie though cavalry cemetery is about as near as i'll ever get to the country say you can set here on this soap-box and let your feet hang down the last janitor's wife used to hang her washing up here i guess i'll leave this door open see you're so kind smiled mary louise can you blame me retorted the gallant charles and vanished mary louise perched on the soap-box unwound her turban draped the damp towel over her shoulders and shook out the wet masses of her hair now the average girl shaking out the wet masses of her hair looks like a drowned rat but nature had been kind to mary louise she had given her hair that curled in little ringlets when wet and that waved in all the right places when dry just now it hung in damp shining strands on either side of her face so that she looked almost remarkably like one of those oval-faced great-eyed red-lipped women that the old italian artists were so fond of painting below her blazing in the sun lay the great stone and iron city mary louise shook out her hair idly with one hand sniffed her parsley shut her eyes threw back her head and began to sing beating time with her heel against the soap-box and forgetting all about the letter that had come that morning stating that it was not from any lack of merit etc she sang and sniffed her parsley and waggled her hair in the breeze and beat time idly with the heel of her little boot when holy cats 
exclaimed a man's voice. What is this, anyway? A Coney Island concession gone wrong? Mary Louise's eyes unclosed in a flash, and Mary Louise gazed upon an irate-looking youngish man who wore shabby slippers and no collar with a full-dress air. I presume that you are the janitor's beautiful daughter, growled the collarless man. Well, not precisely, answered Mary Louise, sweetly. Are you the scrub lady's stalwart son? Ha! exploded the man. But then all women look alike with their hair down. I ask your pardon, though. Not at all, replied Mary Louise. For that matter, all men look like picked chickens with their collars off. At that, the collarless man, who until now had been standing on the top step that led up to the roof, came slowly forward, stepped languidly over a skylight or two, draped his handkerchief over a convenient chimney, and sat down, hugging his long, lean legs to him. "'Nice up here, isn't it?' he remarked. "'It was,' said Mary Louise. "'Ha!' exploded he again. "'Then where's your mirror?' he demanded. "'Mirror?' echoed Mary Louise. "'Certainly. You have the hair, the comb, the attitude, and the general Lorelei effect. Also, your singing lured me to your shores.' "'You don't look lured,' retorted Mary Louise. "'You looked lurid.' "'What's that stuff in your hand?' next demanded he. "'He really was a most astonishingly rude young man.' "'Parsley.' "'Parsley!' shouted he, much as Charlie had done. "'Well, what the—' "'Back home,' elucidated Mary Louise, once more, patiently. After you've washed your hair, you dry it in the back yard, sitting on the grass, in the sunshine and the breeze. And the garden smells come to you, the nasturtiums and the pansies and the geraniums, you know, and even that clean grass smell and the pungent vegetable odor, and there are ants and bees and butterflies. Go on, urged the young man, eagerly. And Mrs. Next Door comes out to hang up a few stockings and a jabot or two, or so, and a couple of baby dresses that she has just rubbed through, and she calls out to you. Washed your hair? Yes, you say. It was something awful, and I wanted it nice for Tuesday night, but I suppose I won't be able to do a thing with it. And then Mrs. Next Door stands there a minute on the clothes-reel platform, with the wind whipping her skirts about her, and the fresh smell of the growing things coming to her, and suddenly she says, I guess I'll wash mine, too, while the baby's asleep. The collarless young man rose from his chimney, picked up his handkerchief, and moved to the chimney just next to Mary Louise's soap-box. Live here? he asked, in his impolite way. If I did not, do you think that I would choose this as the one spot in all New York in which to dry my hair? When I said, live here, I didn't mean just that. I meant, who are you, and why are you here, and where do you come from, and do you sign your real name to your stuff, or use a nom de plume? Why, how did you know? gasped Mary Louise. Give me five minutes more, grinned the keen-eyed young man, and I'll tell you what make your typewriter is, and where the last rejection slip came from. Oh, said Mary Louise again, then you are the scrub lady's stalwart son, and you've been ransacking my waste-basket. Quite unheeding, the collarless man went on. And so you thought you could write, and you came on to New York. You know one doesn't just travel to New York, or ride to it, or come to it. One comes on to New York. And now you're not so sure about the writing, hmm? And back home, what did you do? Back home, I taught school, and hated it. But I kept on teaching until I'd saved five hundred dollars. Every other school, ma'am, in the world teaches until she has saved five hundred dollars, and then she packs two suitcases and goes to Europe from June until September. But I saved my five hundred for New York. I've been here six months now, and the five hundred has shrunk to almost nothing, and if I don't break into the magazines pretty soon, then— then, said Mary Louise, with a quaver in her voice, I'll have to go back and teach thirty-seven young devils that six times five is thirty, put down the knot and carry six, and that the French are a gay people fond of dancing and light wines. 
but i'll scrimp on everything from hairpins to shoes and back again including pretty collars and gloves and hats until i've saved up another five hundred and then i'll try it all over again because i can write from the depths of one capacious pocket the inquiring man took a small black pipe from another a bag of tobacco from another a match the long deft fingers made a brief task of it i didn't ask you he said after the first puff because i could see that you weren't the fool kind that objects then with amazing suddenness know any of the editors know them cried mary louise know them if camping on their doorsteps and haunting the office buildings and cajoling and fighting with secretaries and office boys and assistants and things constitutes knowing them then we're chums what makes you think you can write sneered the thin man mary louise gathered up her brush and comb and towel and parsley and jumped off the soap-box she pointed belligerently at her tormentor with the hand that held the brush being the scrub lady's stalwart son you wouldn't understand but i can write i shan't go under i'm going to make this town count me in as the four million and one th sometimes i get so tired of being nobody at all with not even enough cleverness in me to wrest a living from this big city that i long to stand out at the edge of the curbing and take off my hat and wave it and shout say you four million uncaring people i'm mary louise moss from escanaba michigan and i like your town and i want to stay here won't you please pay some slight attention to me no one knows i'm here except myself and the rent collector and i put in the rude young man oh you sneered mary louise equally rude you don't count the collarless young man in the shabby slippers smiled a curious little twisted smile you never can tell he grinned i might then quite suddenly he stood up knocked the ash out of his pipe and came over to mary louise who was preparing to descend the steep little flight of stairs look here mary louise moss from escanaba michigan you stop trying to write the slop you're writing now stop it drop the love tales that are like the stuff that everybody else writes stop trying to write about new york you don't know anything about it listen you get back to work and write about mrs next door and the hair washing and the vegetable garden and bees and the back yard understand you write the way you talk to me and then you send your stuff in to cecil reeves reeves mocked mary louise cecil reeves of the earth he wouldn't dream of looking at my stuff and anyway it really isn't your affair and began to descend the stairs well you know you brought me up here kicking with your heels and singing at the top of your voice i couldn't work so it's really your fault then just as mary louise had almost disappeared down the stairway he put his last astonishing question how often do you wash your hair he demanded well back home confessed mary louise every six weeks or so was enough but not here put in the rude young man briskly never that's all very well for the country but it won't do in the city once a week at least and on the roof cleanliness demands it but if i'm going back to the country replied mary louise it won't be necessary but you're not calmly said the collarless young man just as mary louise vanished from sight down at the other end of the hallway on mary louise's floor charlie the janitor was doing something to the windows now with a rag and a pail of water get it dry he called out sociably yes thank you answered mary louise and turned to enter her own little apartment then hesitatingly she came back to charlie's window there there was a man up there a very tall very thin very rude very that is rather nice youngish oldish man in slippers and no collar i wonder oh him snorted charlie he don't show himself once in a blue moon none of the other tenants knows he's up there has the whole top floor to himself and shuts himself up there for weeks at a time writing books or some such truck that guy he owns the building owns the building said mary louise faintly why he looked he looked sure grinned charlie that's him name's reeves cecil reeves say ain't that a devil of a name 
End of Sun Dried by Edna Ferber. weeks at least and i could sit here by the window in the sun and dry it with a jerk she brought her straying fingers away from her hair and her wandering eyes away from the sunshine and her runaway thoughts back to the typewritten page for three minutes the snap of the little discs crackled through the stillness of the tiny apartment then suddenly as though succumbing to an irresistible force mary louise rose walked across the room a matter of six steps, removing hairpins as she went, and shoved aside the screen which hid the stationary washbowl by day. Mary Louise turned on a faucet and held her finger under it, while an agonized expression of doubt and suspense overspread her features. Slowly the look of suspense gave way to a smile of beatific content. A sigh, deep, soul-filling, satisfied, welled up from Mary Louise's breast, the water was hot. Half an hour later, head swathed, turban fashion, in a towel, Mary Louise, Mary Louise was seized with the feeling at ten o'clock on a joyous June morning. She tried to fight it off because she had got to that stage in the construction of her story where her hero was beginning to talk and act a little more like a real live man and a little less like a clothing store dummy. By the way, they don't seem to be using those pink-and-white, black-mustachioed figures any more. Another good simile gone. Mary Louise had been battling with that hero for a week. He wouldn't make love to the heroine. In vain had Mary Louise striven to instill red blood into his watery veins. He and the beauteous heroine were as far apart as they had been on page one of the typewritten manuscript. Mary Louise was developing nerves over him. She had bitten her fingernails and twisted her hair into corkscrews over him. She had risen every morning at the chaste hour of seven, breakfasted hurriedly, tidied the tiny two-room apartment, strolled over to the window. Then she stopped, aghast. In that half-hour the sun had slipped just around the corner, and was now beating brightly and uselessly against the brick wall a few inches away. Slowly, Mary Louise unwound the towel, bent double in the contortionistic attitude that women assume on such occasions, and watched with melancholy eyes while the drops trickled down to the ends of her hair and fell, unsunned, to the floor. If only, thought Mary Louise bitterly, there was such a thing as a backyard in the city, a backyard where I could squat on the grass in the sunshine and the breeze. Maybe there is. I'll ask the janitor. She bound her hair in the turban again, and opened the door. At the far end of the long dim hallway, Charlie, the janitor, was doing something to the floor with a mop and a great deal of sloppy water, whistling the while with a shrill abandon that had announced his presence to Mary Louise. Oh, Charlie! called Mary Louise, and sat down in the unromantic morning light to wrestle with her stick of a hero. She had made her heroine a creature of grace, wit, and loveliness, but thus far the hero had not once clasped her to him fiercely, or pressed his lips to her hair, her eyes, her cheeks. Nay, as the story-writers would put it, he hadn't even devoured her with his gaze. This morning, however, he had begun to show some signs of life. He was developing possibilities. Whereupon, at this critical stage in the story-writing game, the hair-washing mania seized Mary Louise. She tried to dismiss the idea. She pushed it out of her mind and slammed the door. It only popped in again. Her fingers wandered to her hair. Her eyes wandered to the June sunshine outside. The hero was left poised, arms outstretched, an unquenchable love-light burning in his eyes, while Mary Louise mused thus. It certainly feels sticky. It's been six. Sun Dried by Edna Ferber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Sun Dried by Edna Ferber. 
there come those times in the life of every woman when she feels that she must wash her hair at once and then she does it the feeling may come upon her suddenly without warning at any hour of the day or night or its approach may be slow and insidious so that the victim does not at first realize what it is that fills her with that sensation of unrest but once in the clutches of the idea she knows no happiness no peace until she has donned a kimono gathered up two bath towels a spray and the green soap and she breathes again only when head dripping she makes for the back yard the sitting-room radiator or the side porch depending on her place of residence and the time of year